So uh, today I'm going to be talking about push-based execution in DuckDB, which is a change we recently made to the execution engine in DuckDB and how it works. So um, yeah, I actually did not introduce you, Mark. So Mark, oh, 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 cool. well, I mean, you're at, at you're the beginning, can you you and you are a co-founder of DuckDB Labs. These are two main facts that I would like to highlight before you go to slide number two. Thank and you, thank you. Excited to listen to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, you've already seen part of this, so. Uh... <laughs> All right. Yes, um, I am indeed both of those things. All right. So execution in databases. Uh, now it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Execution in database. So I'm sure I don't need to tell uh, most of the people here this, but just as a quick recap, how does database work? Well, databases, they transform SQL into query plans, more or less, and these query plans contain operators. So for example, if I have a query like the one here, I have a, a aggregate, I have a join, um, and I have two table sources, my query tree could look something like this, right? I have a hash group by, a hash join on my two tables, um, and that produces the result. Now, somehow these operators need to be executed. Um, how do you do that? Well, on the high level, there's two kind of distinct paradigms there. You have a pull-based model and a push-based model. So in the pull-based model, you have these different operators, um, and they kind of they pull data from each other when required. Uh, and the push-based model is the opposite. The data gets pushed into the operators. Um, the pull-based model, it's kind of like the canonical way. It's how most older, like, tra uh, like um, how the traditional systems did this. And initially, DuckDB also uh, started out with a pull-based execution model, which we call the vector volcano. So how does it work? Well, essentially, every operator has this method called get chunk. Um, the query starts by calling get chunk on the root node, and these nodes they recursively call get chunk on the children. So, for example, if you have like a projection, how would that look? Well, you call you pull a chunk from the from your child node. You check do I have anything left to process? If so, if not, I bail out. Otherwise, I run my expressions, I execute all my expressions, I compute my results, and then I move up again in the tree and I return my result. Right? So, kind of straightforward, um, not too complex. Uh, at least when we're talking about single-threaded execution, of course, um, because single-threaded execution just runs this plan and you're good. Multi-threaded execution, however, not so not so easy in this uh, model. And uh, well, as we know, uh, computers, many cores, especially for uh, uh, analytical systems, it's kind of important to run in parallel because if you have 100 cores and you run in parallel, you run 100 times faster, ideally. Um, so it's kind of a big deal, let's say. So how do you do that? How do you make this model parallelism aware? Well, the classical solution to this is the exchange operator, which basically means that at like query compile time, you, part you split your query plan into different partitions. Uh, these partitions, they can be executed independently. And then you just have like uh, some exchange operator where all of the sort of logic of combining um, different, like the results from these different partitions is, um, is handled so that all the operators themselves, they don't need to be changed. You can just like put all of the logic into these, um, in, these in the exchange operators. Uh, this has some problems. Uh, like you have to decide at compile time what you're gonna like, how you're gonna partition this plan. You get kind of a plan explosion, um, especially if you have like 100 cores, 500 cores. Your plan gets quite big. It can be a problem. Um, plus, you have quite like these operators themselves. They're not parallelism aware. You lose a lot of uh, a lot of state. You probably have to materialize stuff, and you get uh, you get some added materialization costs. So not ideal. Um, luckily, there's a better way. Um, so uh, some of the highly esteemed get, uh, people we have here today have invented morsel-driven parallelism, um, which is a much nicer way of doing this, where you make individual operators parallelism aware. So how this works at a high level is that the query is divided into pipelines. And within these individual pipelines, you then execute um, the pipelines in parallel. So for example, uh, how, how do we do this partitioning? Well, um, what we, what, like a kind of the observation is that we, ha uh, we have like these crossroads, like these operators where we need to um, materialize something or like we need to fully process one side or all of the child nodes or whatever, like the child operators. So one example is, for example, if you have a hash join, you can't really start probing until you have finished the builds, because if you do, well, you get a wrong result. 
Um, another example is like a hash aggregate. You can't really start emitting tuples from a hash aggregate until you have computed the full, uh, like until you have processed all of the inputs. So these nodes are called pipeline breakers. Now, if we go back to our previous query, um, where we have this join, we have this aggregate, you can see we have two pipeline breakers here. We have the, uh, the hash group by and we have the hash join. And you can see that this, uh, this query plan gets turned into two pipelines. First, we have the hash join build on orders. Then we have the hash aggregates uh, that scans from line item, probes this hash table, and then computes the aggregates. And you can kind of see that there's this dependency, right? Like you can't start uh, probing until you build. So the, the second pipeline depends on the first pipeline. So in these like pipelines, the contention, it happens at the endpoint. So um, you have a source, you have a scan. Uh, of course, there's some like uh, some way threads need to like um, uh, handle their like shared state there, right? Because you don't want to scan, you want to scan every tuple exactly once. So there's some form of contention. There's some way that you need to partition the source tables. The sinks, again, they have contention because all of the data flows into the same operators. So you have to somehow handle this. Um, and in this, um, in this model, of course, the nice thing is this contention, um, it's, it, it is resolved by using parallelism aware operators at these endpoints. So at the sinks and the source, you get parallelism awareness. These other operators like a hash pro, projection filter, they don't actually need to be aware of the um, of the like the fact that anything is happening in parallel because well if you want to run a filter you know like this can uh, occur in parallel you don't have to like communicate between the other filter nodes um, so in that sense the parallelism is like constrained quite cleanly to a select few nodes um, uh, yeah so how do you do that well. Um, somehow you need to make these operators parallelism aware. So you need to define some interface that these operators can implement. So for the sinks, what we have uh, defined like previously when we first implemented this uh, was this interface uh, where they, the sinks can define like a global and a local state. Um, essentially you call sync, like push data into the sync uh, until all the data is exhausted. Then you have like some com combined method where you can combine results from multiple different threads together. Like for example, if you have a, a, an aggregate, you will first like uh, do some aggregation in like a thread local buffer because you want to limit contention. Then in the combine, you like push everything together to a global, uh, to, to like a global hash table that contains the final result. And then you have the finalized method, which is just called once where you say like, okay, now round off everything that I've done so far, right? Um, so for example, if we have a hash join, how is this implemented? Well, in our sync method, we can just sync data into a hash table. Um, I mean, this is like super simplified. Of course you would, uh, you have to manage the contention somehow, but like this is a high level, how it works. You sync data into the build uh, of the hash table. And then on the other side, you still have a get chunk where you can still kind of do this, uh, this pool based model. At least that's how it's, used to work is that we kind of had this hybrid of a pull-based and a pull-push-based model, right? Um, where the sync was the push-based, and but we would still have this probing, which was pulling data from the uh, from the child nodes and then propagating it upwards using a traditional pull-based model. Um, so how does this work from like an execution perspective? Well, you can, like I said, you get this kind of like weird hybrid where you have a sync, the sync has a child, you pull data from the sync and then you push it into the sync. You pull data from the child, push it into the sync. After the sync is finished, like after you've exhausted the child, um, you call the combined method. After all the threads are finished, you call the finalized method. Um, so kind of works. How do you partition a source though? So uh, that's not as straightforward in this like hybrid pull push model because the sources they're located at like the bottom of the pipeline. So you kind of need to go all the way around um, to like the root of the get chunk. So it's not so nice. So what we did was we had this sort of like thread context where we would set up like tasks and the tasks would then define how the scan is partitioned. When we actually reach the scan, we would then read the tasks and we could then like read only the morsel or uh, row group or partition that you uh, actually want to scan. And in this manner, you kind of get this um, partitioning of, this, uh, of the sources, but it's not so nice. Um, yeah, so it, the model we had, it mostly works, but there was a bunch of problems. So like I mentioned before, the interface for source parallelism is not very clean. We have a very nice interface for sync parallelism, sources not so much. Um, you still have like the main problem of this uh, pool-based stuff, uh, or, like one of the problems of this pool-based stuff, 
um, is that you have this data flow duplication in every operator. Like you don't have a centralized data flow. Every single operator models the data flow by itself. And that's not so not very nice for various reasons. Um, and it doesn't quite solve like the uh, like the parallelization fully. It works in some cases, but there's still like uh, you may you don't only need to. Uh, there's some complex case like the union nodes or the full right outer joints where you have to do some additional steps to get like nice par uh, parallelism going that uh, are not so nice to model in this uh, in this model. Um, Otherwise, you also have like stuff like scan sharing. Again, not very pretty in this model, and async I/O, of course. Uh, especially if you are reading like from S3, from like a HTTP backend, you really want to do async I/O, and in this model, that's just not very nice. So, how do we solve that? Well, push-based execution. Um, so what is push-based execution? Well, I uh, kind of explained this before as well. Our previous model was pull-based. Um, operators, they call get chunk when the operator requires data. Push-based is the other way around. So data gets pushed into operators. And that kind of means that the execution flow, like the flow around the operators, it's moved out of the operators itself and it's moved into like a centralized executor uh, that dictates how the data moves. And like I mentioned before, the sync interface we had before was already pushed based. So we already had like a like a, a kind of a mix and match going. Um, so the, the data flow gets moved to a, sim, a central location. And this simplifies the implementation of operators uh, quite significantly, right? Because now you don't need to pull anymore. You don't need to have this like repeated code that you see where you're like, okay, I pull from my child. Are we done? I pull from my child. Are we done? Um, but of course, it also reduces flexibility in the sense that um, the operators, they cannot know, they can no longer just do whatever, right? Like in a, in a pull-based model, the operators can really like do like very crazy stuff. You can imagine like, oh, I fetch from the left side, I fetch from the right side, I fetch from the left side. That's no longer really um, possible because you need to central, like you need to store this up in a central location. Um, but in general, like at least for uh, what we've done, it's not, it, it, this doesn't appear to give any problems. Like the execution flow in a database system is like standardized enough to where you can just put this in like one executor and um, it will work out, let's say. Um, so how does uh, how do you do this from a code perspective? How do you make a push-based model? Well, we, before we saw we had this like sync interface. Well, we kind of just need to do the same, um, and we kind of re realized that uh, recognize that we have now three different distinct uh, nodes, right? We have the syncs that we had before. Now we have the operators and we have the sources. So operators, what do they do? Well, they process data. They take an input and it uh, like optionally result in an output. So you can think of like a projection, a filter, a hash pro, like kind of the simple, like the, the, the uh, not necessarily simple, but the things that um, don't actually require any sort of coordination between threads, um, which makes them from an interface perspective a lot simpler. Um, and then you have the sources and the sources are the stuff that actually emits the data. And you can talk, think about like table scans, of course, but also uh, sources can exist in like the middle of the plan because you can have like an aggregate hash table scan or a scan of an order by where you have at some point you have done a bunch of computation, you have materialized it, and then you need to scan it again. That is also a source, of course. Um, and one of the things you will also maybe uh, realize here is that uh, these operators, they can fulfill multiple roles depending on where they are in the pipeline, right? Because um, a hash table, um, like an order by, it is first the sync um, when it's being constructed and then it becomes a source. So these operators, they can be, they can be like fulfill multiple of these roles. Um, sorry, I get like notifications on admitting people and it like breaks my slides somehow. Um, yes, all right. So what does the operator interface look like? Um, well, the operator interface, like I kind of uh, hinted at before, it's quite simple because you don't need any of this um, like coordination between threads, right? So what do you have? Well, you have a context. Sure, you have an operator state, uh, nothing too crazy. You get an input data chunk and you give back an output data chunk. So it's in that sense, it's quite similar to the get chunk we saw before, um, with the exception that the input is pushed into the operator instead of read by the operator. Um, and also there's this operator result type that comes back. Uh, so why do we need that? Well, um, I'll come back to that later. Uh, so in this model, a projection, it's kind of straightforward to implement. You can see 
Compared to the pool-based model, this has been simplified a lot because we no longer need to do any of the sort of data flow around it. We can just say, okay, I get an input data chunk, I run my expressions, I push into my output data chunk. And that's kind of like all the code there is there. You don't need to do anything uh, anything crazy anymore. It's, it's, it gets simplified a lot. Um, a hash probe at first also seems kind of straightforward, right? Because you do a probe, you get an input and you push to an output result. Um, but it's actually not that uh, straightforward because a single tuple can have multiple matches. So, um, and in the worst case, of course, there can be like millions or billions of tuples streaming out of like just one input tuple. And because we have like a vectorized system, uh, ideally we process these things in batches, right? So you don't just want to input one tuple and output a million tuples. You want to input like a thousand tuples and output a thousand tuples. So uh, these operators, they now need a way of signaling that they're not done with processing the input um, because they can no longer kind of handle this themselves, right? They need to now delegate this task to like the central executor. Uh, so this is what this operator result type is used for. So the operator uh, can kind of return its current state or like what, what it wants uh, to do. So there's three options here. The need more input is kind of like the default one where it's like, okay, um, I give you my output and I wanna be called with a new input again. So like a projection will always return this because a projection will always take a, X tuples as input and output X tuples as output. Um, a filter also will always return this because it can only reduce the cardinality, it cannot increase it. Then there is the half more output, which is uh, what solves this uh, hash probe case, like I mentioned before, because the um, what can happen then is an input arrives, we can produce an output chunk. And then if we have more stuff to emit, we can just say, okay, we have more output remaining. Please call me again with the same input chunk. And you get kind of this behavior that we had before as well in the pool-based model, uh, but now handled by this central executor, um, which also simplifies the code quite a lot. Finally, we have this finished flag, um, which is kind of like, okay, uh, everything is done. The pipeline is done. Um, we're finished. Uh, and you may be wondering, okay, why do we need this? Um, well, uh, the finish is required to interrupt execution. And the reason this is required is, again, because of the central executor. Uh, in a pool-based model, this kind of just happens by itself, right? Like you say, if you have a limit 10, uh, in a pool-based model, you pull a chunk, you say, okay, I've emitted 10 tuples now, I'm done. And you just no longer pull more chunks. But in a push-based model, this all needs to be like explicit. You need to say, okay, now I want, uh, now I have like, um, uh, now I have finished execution. Now I need the central executor to actually stop. So I need to have this return code. Um, and that's what this like finished flag is for. Uh, the source interface, um, this is a bit more uh, complex because we now, again, we have these states. We have this global state with this local state. It looks quite similar to the sync interface. Um, this is also still a pool-based interface. It's still like uh, probably going to change um, once we get the async IO going. Um, but for now, it's still a, a, a pool-based interface on the sources just. Um, and the idea is that now we need to handle this, um, this contention. And now we can actually handle it cleanly because we have a dedicated, uh, we have these dedicated states. We no longer need to do this sort of like, I always set up a task and then I scan it. We can have like a global state, a local state, and um, the, 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 uh, the operator itself can be implemented in a parallelism aware manner. Um, using these states and like uh, communicating using these um, like in the global state. So for example, we have a scan over a table. Um, we can say like, okay, thread one reads the first morsel and we update the global source state and the next thread can just read the next morsel, et cetera. That all happens in this global state. Um, all right. So that's kind of the interface level of how uh, this works. I won't go into like how all the operators are implemented. Of course, that depends on the um, individual operators. Um, but now we have a interesting problem, of course, uh, is how do we implement unions? Um, so one way of doing this uh, in a, uh, in a push-based model would of course be to take the join approach where you just fully materialize uh, one of the sides and then you do something else. You could do that, but it's not very efficient. Um, especially, and it's not very appealing, especially because in a, a pool-based model, uh, you can do this much more cleanly, right? In a pool-based model, what you can do is you can just say, okay, um, first I pull chunks from my left side, and then once I'm done with that, I pull chunks from my right side. So it's kind of easy because in a pool-based model, we do this, um, we, we have full control over 
the, the flow within our operators, right? Um, and ideally, you don't want a union to be a sink. You don't want it to be a pipeline breaker. You don't want it. To, you don't want to materialize anything. You just want it to be streaming like any other operator. So, how do you do that in a push-based system? Um, well, in theory, it's quite uh, quite easy because if you encounter a union, uh, what you're actually encountering is two pipelines that share the same sink. Or if you have three unions, it's three pipelines that share the same sink. Um, so what you can do is you can just create like multiple pipelines that all point to the same sink that pull, push data into the same sink, and then it will all work out. And then we just need to call sync finalize after all the pipelines are done. Um, the problem is that is kind of like from a scheduling perspective, you now need to solve uh, the, the problem of where uh, like two pipelines point towards the same sink. Because what we had before when we did pipeline scheduling is that it would schedule like entire pipelines. So you would say in our previous example, I have a hash table built on orders, I build it on orders, and then I have a hash, uh, and then I have my second pipeline that depends on this. Um, I will just schedule the entire pipeline. But again, this doesn't really work um, in the case of the union because we now have uh, two pipelines that actually need the finalized to be called only once, right? Uh, so how do we solve that? Well. The way that we solved it is by splitting these pipelines up into events. So instead of scheduling an entire pipeline, we now schedule different events. We schedule a, uh, an execute event where the actual pipeline gets executed. We schedule a finish event where the finalized uh, method gets called and we schedule a complete event, which um, signifies that the pipeline is completed and that any dependent pipelines can be uh, scheduled. Um, and so these events, they're like internally, an event can be processed by multiple threads, right? So it's not that just because it's one event, the pipeline execute can only be run by one thread. Um, this is just like the high level flow of how the um, of how the uh, the query gets executed, right? Um, so in their union, what we can now do is we have like a much nicer solution. Um, we can schedule two different pipeline executes that now point towards the same finalize. Um, and then the, the graph continues kind of as is. And this gives us a very nice uh, behavior where we just have two distinct uh, union pipelines um, that get executed, that can run completely in parallel um, internally and between themselves as well. Um, and only then do we call the, uh, the finalized method um, and we only call it once, right? So now we can do this union in a very nice, like high level manner, um, completely in parallel and um, well, Nicely. Um, and of course, this also scales up to however many unions you have. Uh, you can just add on events, right? So you can combine these in whichever way you like. Uh, the full and the right outer join actually have a quite similar challenge in the sense that if you have a full right outer join, um, you kind of have three phases. You don't have two like a normal, uh, like a normal hash join. Uh, and that's because after the probing is completed, you need to now scan the hash table to figure out which uh, tuples have not had a match, right? So if you have a full right outer join, you keep track of the matches, like the tuples that have uh, found a join partner inside the hash table. And now you have this third step where you say, okay, after I'm done probing everything, I need to scan the hash table again. And this actually fits quite nicely into this model, this event model as well. Because now what you can do is if you have a, a hash probe, you can simply say, okay, if I have an outer join, a right outer join, I can schedule a scan of this, um, of this hash table after I'm done probing, but before I call my finalize. And um, this uh, like slots in quite nicely in this event model uh, because you just push another event before the finalize happens. Um, and of course, this can also uh, like scale, uh, like uh, you can see how this works with multiple full right outer joints as well, right? You just push multiple events, um, of course, in the right order, because if you have multiple full outer joints, the one outer join will influence the other outer join, but it does work quite nicely. And all of this can be done in parallel. So you can also do the, um, the scan of the hash table again in parallel, which is of course uh, quite important if you have this like hundred uh, core scenario that like everything needs to be parallelized. Um, so that works quite nicely. Um, another uh, event where the, another case where this event model works quite nicely is when sinks have an expensive finalized step. For example, in our order by in our order by, if we have a lot of uh, tuples to order by, um, and we do an out of core order, we may have to do like a merge sort of some sorts, right? And again, you want to do everything you can in parallel, so that needs to be executed in parallel as well. 
so how can we do this in this event model? Well, it's quite nice because we have this complete event at the end. What the finalize can do is it can just schedule new events that kind of come between it and the complete event. So now you say, okay, I finalize my order by, I schedule a merge phase, and then I can schedule another merge phase. And this can kind of, you can schedule as many as you want, because of course, um, how, how many merge phases you need depends on how much data you have, uh, maybe even on how much memory you have, because you may flush more stuff to disk if you have less memory. Uh, so this is totally like you, you don't know upfront. So um, you can kind of just schedule more events and get that to happen. So that works uh, very nice as well. Uh, so that is kind of what we have now on the push phase execution. It's all been merged, I think, a month or so ago. Uh, but there's still some stuff we have to do. So um, uh, Thomas Hintz does this as well uh, before, is the scan sharing. So one very nice feature of the push phase execution is that you can very easily take data from one source and push it into multiple syncs or multiple nodes. Um, and this is kind of nice because you can do kind of very easily scan sharing or even just operator sharing. Like, if, right, if I have like a scan, I have a, a projection on top and then a filter, and then uh, I can push it into two different operators. Um, and that's kind of a nice feature of the push based model uh, that we haven't implemented yet, but uh, definitely will, um, which is that you can kind of detect, hey, I have two, uh, two of the same source. I can now push to two of the like, different nodes. So for example, in this query, if you have um, two aggregations over the line item table that are like union all together, um, you can just push uh, from one scan into both of those nodes and it will be much more efficient because you don't need to go to disk twice. Uh, this is slightly complicated by like projection and filter pushdown, of course, um, because then the question kind of becomes, okay, if I have one scan that scans three columns from my table and have another scan that scans like two of those columns, but like five more, uh, the scan sharing gets like a bit more complicated. Um, and of course, in a columnar storage system, if the scans, if the columns they scan are entirely disjoint, you probably don't want to do the scan sharing at all in the first place, right? Um, because you're reading entirely different stuff from disk. But of course, um, at least in DuckDB, we do support scanning from alternate storage formats as well. So if, maybe if you're scanning from like a row-based format, you do then again want to do the sh uh, the scan share, so it's kind of like an interesting. Uh, there's some interesting sub problems there. Also with filters, um, because if I do a filter push down into my scan, um, like I could like unify the filters, do, kind of combine with an or, but then does it that help if they're entirely disjoint? Maybe not. So it's kind of an interesting problem. Um, at least maybe more interesting than it seems on the surface level. Another thing that's on our to do list is async I/O. Uh, so currently scans are still push based that works fine for in-memory data, but if you do a read uh, from disk or HTTP, um, your get data, it just kind of stalls on the read, right? You have a blocking read and um, that's not ideal because, uh, well, your execution is waiting for a stall and not doing anything in the meantime. So async IO is a great solution to this because it solves this by pushing the IO to background threads so your executors can work while the IO is happening. Um, and that's, of course, very nice and also slots in quite nicely into a push based model. Um, there's like some uh, like interesting problem there as well, though, which is that um, one of the things we have wanted to implement in DuckDB that's not there yet is hybrid early slash late materialization. So one problem with async IO is that you, you kind of do this prefetch, right? You just read all the stuff up front and only then do you do the processing. Um, but sometimes late materialization is better. It really depends on the query. Uh, so, for example, if you have a query with selected predicates on one column, uh, late materialization is probably going to win because you read less from disk. So, for example, if I have a query like this, where I do like um, uh, a semi-join on like a table where I, in the end, only need like five rows from like my line item table. Um, if I end up reading my entire line item table, especially if it's from disk, I, I read all of the columns. Um, but I throw away almost everything. In the end, all I only really needed to read was the L order key column and a few rows from the other columns, right? Um, and like these types of queries are where latent materialization shines and um, using, like, uh, using like lazy vectors, um, we can kind of have this hybrid of early and late materialization by having these vectors that when they actually get used, then we go to fetch the data from disk. However, that kind of has a conflict with async IO 
because uh, async IO naturally you prefetch everything. Um, it doesn't line up well with a random read where the vector says, okay, now I need my data, go read it, right? So there's like, um, like a conflict there. So one of the potential solutions we want to do there um, in the ideal case, of course, is like some hybrid where you say, okay, we're going to prefetch stuff with async IO. But if we see that um, some columns data is never being touched, maybe we stop prefetching that column and we switch to like a model where we actually do the read only when it's uh, required. Um, all right, so that's all on the push-based execution for now. Thanks for listening and uh, happy to take any questions.